Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Feldick, a 30-minute walk through the scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Feldick. Okay, I guess we're on. I didn't think we were. <laughs> All right. Good to see everybody back. You got your coffee, and we're going to go right into our uh, second half hour this afternoon. And again, we like to remind our television audience of a question and answer book that uh, we've had published with 88 questions that normally come in, and the answers are taken from our previous television broadcast. And uh, it's been well received, and we decided to uh, let people know again that are new to our ministry that it's still available and uh, we send it out postage paid for $11. And so we feel it's uh, a lot of information for just a few dollars. Okay, now we're just a Bible study and as we always let our new listeners realize that we're not associated with any particular denomination as such. And uh, we're just gonna get right back into the book again this afternoon and start now on the other part of the kingdom of God, which is the body of Christ. And we always have to keep those two entities totally separated. The kingdom of heaven, as Jesus and the Twelve preached it, was the promise coming up from the Old Testament, beginning especially with King David, that there would be a royal king coming out of the Lion of David who would rule and reign from Jerusalem, and uh, Israel would be the top dog of the nations, and all the other nations of the world would be subservient to the nation of Israel and her king. And so this is why it's heaven on earth. Satan has been taken off the scene. He is locked up for a thousand years and the earth will be reverted back as we saw in the last half hour as it was in the Garden of Eden. And uh, it's just going to be a glorious kingdom on earth with the rule of heaven upon it. All right, now then. Also in the kingdom of God, we have what has been revealed to the Apostle Paul, and that is the body of Christ. Now, the first thing I'm going to prove from Scripture is, contrary to what some of these people who poo-poo the whole idea of end-time prophecy, they ridicule the rapture because they claim that none of this is now apropos, that everything was culminated with 70 A.D. and Israel ceased to be a nation, Consequently, there is no end time prophecy. Now the word for that kind of stuff is preterism. And it comes from a Greek word that I think just means uh, end of everything or something like that. But anyhow, they're making big inroads lately and uh, I guess if I get opposition from anybody, it's from people who are listening to that kind of stuff. And as I'm constantly making mention, if you're gonna believe that Israel has ceased to be a nation and that none of these end time prophecies can be fulfilled, then you gotta throw half this book away. And the Bible is plain that if you take anything away from the words of this book, then you're doomed. And so I trust that a lot of these people are gonna wake up before it's too late. But anyway, one of them that I was reading one time, and I do, I read them because I wanna know what the opposition is thinking. And one of them made a statement one time, there is nothing in Scripture to indicate that there would be a parenthetical period of time, as I refer to it and others, there's nothing to indicate that there will be a parenthetical end of, uh, period of time between God dealing this and then picking it up and dealing that. Well, I'm just going to show you that there is. There's all kinds of evidence of a parenthetical period of time. And we're going to start in, honey, at Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4, and this is going to lead into a few lessons now concerning the body of Christ of which you and I as believers in this period of time are members. We are members of the body of Christ and the body of Christ is in the kingdom of God. I hope I've made that point now and I think the circles help. Sharon, I thank you. It's a, it's a good job. It really shows clearly that these two entities are all in the kingdom of God. All right, but Luke chapter 4, and it's at the beginning of Christ's earthly ministry, and he's in the synagogue of Nazareth where he grew up. <clears throat> now, we've looked at all this before. It's repetition, but repetition is the mother of learning. We hear that all the time. All right, Luke chapter 4, and dropping down to verse 16. Luke 4 Verse 16, And he, Jesus, came to Nazareth, 
where he had been brought up, and as his custom was, remember he's under the law, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. And there was delivered unto him the book, or the scroll, of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the scroll, he found, which indicates he knew what he wanted to read, and when he had found the place where it was written, now verse 18, he's reading Isaiah 61, 1, 2, and 3, and we'll go back and look at it in just a minute. But he's going to continue reading in the synagogue. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. And we know that from Matthew chapter 9, the gospel he preached was the gospel of the kingdom. This kingdom that we've been talking about was mentioned all the way up through the Old Testament. Jesus proclaimed it. John the Baptist proclaimed it. Peter and the eleven preached it. This glorious coming kingdom promised to the nation of Israel. And so this is the whole purpose of his earthly ministry, was to prove to Israel who he was. But they rejected it in unbelief. Okay, but here is evidence <laughs> that as God the ruler and sustainer and creator of the universe, Jesus Christ knew the end from the beginning. And here's where he proves it. So, reading on. He's going to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, that is, the Old Testament believers who were down in the paradise side of Hades, remember the recovering of sight to the blind, and to set at liberty them that are bruised, verse 19 now, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Okay, now come all the way back to Isaiah chapter 61. <coughs> Isaiah 61. And here's where he's reading. But now keep Luke 4, so you can flip back and forth. I sh should have told you. Keep Luke 4, so that you can see what he did. Already? Well, we won't read all of verse 61, uh, verse 1 of 61, but let's just jump in at verse 2. Isaiah 61, verse 2. To proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Now, from Luke 4, you'll find that's where he stopped, isn't it? That's where he stopped. And that's why they were so amazed in the synagogue. Why did he stop in the middle of a verse? Well, he knew why, but nobody else ever figured it out. Until now we get into the church age, we can look back. Sure, he knew that that's where everything was going to stop until this parenthetical period of time that we call the church age has been fulfilled. Then the rest of Isaiah 61 will be fulfilled. Now read on. After he stopped, Isaiah says, and the day of vengeance. See, that's the process. He has come in his first advent. He's preaching the coming of the kingdom and his messiahship. And then he doesn't mention his rejection here. But then the prophet goes on and foretells the tribulation, the day of vengeance of our God. And then he goes on and introduces the kingdom to comfort all that mourn. You remember what we read in Isaiah 11 in the last program? That this would be part and parcel of his rule and reign, that he would be benevolent to the downtrodden and he would comfort those that mourn. Well, the same thing here. So here is Isaiah's way of referring to this coming kingdom. All right, but Jesus stopped at the end of his first advent and did not mention the last part of the prophecy, which meant he knew that prophecy was going to stop for a period of time, and then it would pick up again. Now, let's go look at another one up in the New Testament. Come up with me, if you will, to Acts chapter 13. I hope I'm making sense. Now, remember what I'm trying to show is that there is ample scriptural proof that the prophetic program that's laid out in the Old Testament would be interrupted to bring in a parenthetical period of time for this age of grace. And when it's over, the rest of the prophecy will be fulfilled. And that's why I'm always putting my timeline up on the board, that when we get to that point in Acts, 
where Paul starts preaching to the Gentiles until the rapture, and then God will pick up again where he left off with Israel back in the book of Acts. All right, but Acts chapter 13, and Paul and Barnabas have just begun their missionary journeys out from Antioch, and uh, they are on their way, and they've stopped at Cyprus out there in the Mediterranean Sea, and drop in now at 13 verse 6. Acts 13, verse 6. It's been years since we taught all this, but it uh, won't hurt to do it again. All got it? So when they had gone through the isle, that is Cyprus, and they came to Paphos, which is at the western end, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, but he was a what? A Jew. And his name was Bar-Jesus. Now verse 7. This Jew was with the deputy or the governor of the islands of Cyprus, and he was a Roman, Sergius Paulus, a Gentile, a prudent man, who called for Barnabas and Saul and desired to hear the word of God. Here we have the first instance in Scripture now where a Gentile is showing interest and a Jew is opposing him. All right, verse 8. Elimus the sorcerer, for so is his name by interpretation, withstood them, that is, Paul and Barnabas, seeking to turn away the deputy, the Roman, from the faith. Now verse 9, Then Saul, who also is called Paul, filled with the Holy Ghost, or the Holy Spirit, set his eyes on him, and he said, O oh, full of all subtlety and all mischief, thou child of the devil, thou enemy of all righteousness, wilt thou not cease or will you not stop perverting the right ways of the Lord? Now verse 11, Now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon thee, and thou shalt be blind physically, and thou shalt be blind, not seeing the sun forever, the rest of your life, but for what? A season, a period of time. In other words, Paul put the curse, if you want to call it, on this man, that he would become physical blind, not for his whole lifetime, but for a period of time. A period of time, known only to God. And that's where we leave it. All right, so he says that you'll not see the sun for a season, and immediately there fell on him a mist and a darkness, and he went about seeking him to lead him by the hand. All right, now what's the big picture? Well, that's what Israel did. When Israel rejected the Messiah, they crucified him, well, along with the Romans, of course. God raised him from the dead, called him back to glory, Peter and the eleven in Acts 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6 continue to plead with the nation of Israel to repent of having killed their Messiah, that he's alive and he could still return and give them this promised kingdom. But will they? No, they will not. And they, they oppose Paul at every step of the way. And so what did God do? Well, let me show you from Scripture what God did. Turn ahead to Romans. Now jump up to Romans. We're through here in Acts for now. Chapter 11. Just exactly like he did with the false prophet Jew on the island of Cyprus, which was just an example, a prophetic illustration of what the nation as a whole would be doing. <coughs> Romans chapter 11. Oh, let's just drop in at verse 5, because verse 6 makes the statement that I want to refer to. But now Romans 11, verse 5. Even so then, Paul says, at this present time, that is during his ministry, there is a remnant. There were a few Jews responding to his preaching, of course. There is a remnant according to the election of grace, and if it's by grace, then it's no more works, Otherwise, grace is no more grace. 
But if it be of works, see how we're explaining that it's by faith and faith alone, not with any works of righteousness which we have done? All right. But if it be of works, then it is no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. Now, verse 7. What then? Israel, the nation, has not obtained that which he seeketh for. And what were they seeking? A Messiah to set up that kingdom promised ever since almost King David. This glorious earthly kingdom that we've been talking about now for the last five, six programs. The Jews knew that was in their future. They still do. That's why the Jew will constantly exclaim what? Next year, Jerusalem. Why? Hopefully the Messiah will be back. And they're still looking for him. See? Okay, but now read on. But the election, those who did believe, they obtained it. And the rest, that is, of the nation of Israel, were what? Blinded. Now, is it fitting? This Jew on the island of Cyprus was opposing the truth going to a Gentile. And God put blindness on him for a season. Not for the rest of his life, but for a time. All right, now we've got the same thing here with the Apostle Paul being opposed by so many of the Jewish element, especially in Thessalonica and up in that area of Greece. And so now he is inspired the Spirit to write, what's happening? Well, the nation has been supernaturally blinded by an act of God because of their unbelief. And God doesn't say how long to be blind, and we're going to see that in just a minute from a couple of the verse. But I want you to see is that God intervened in the life of this false prophet on Cyprus. He intervened in the spiritual life of the whole nation with the same concept that they would be blind for a season. All right, now let's see where we can put it a little closer. Come back again now to Acts chapter 15. Acts chapter 15. Now, of course, the setting in Acts 15 is the Jerusalem Council, and we've spent a lot of time on this one over the years, where the Jerusalem church people have been plaguing Paul and his ministry amongst the Gentile by coming in behind him and telling that uh, Paul's Gentile believers had to be circumcised and keep the Mosaic law or they couldn't be saved. And Paul was just about going frantic over it. He said, you don't have to become Judaistic. You are saved by faith plus nothing. But the Judaizers said, no, you've got to be. All right, so they came to Jerusalem to settle the problem. In fact, I guess I better just go all the way back because otherwise you don't know where I'm coming from. Chapter 15, verse 1. We'll do this quickly. Acts 15, verse 1. Now, I really shouldn't apologize because almost every place that I've been from one end of this country to the other, and if I happen to teach this, the people will come up, a crowd around me, and you know what they say? Never knew this was in our Bible. Most people don't know that this chapter is in here. And it's as plain as day. Here we have these Jews coming in behind Paul's Gentile congregations telling them this. Okay? Acts 15, verse 1. Certain men came down from Judea, the Jerusalem church, and they taught the brethren, Paul's Gentile converts, and they said, Except you be circumcised after the manner of Moses, you cannot be saved. See how plain that is? Now then, verse 2, when therefore Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and disputation with them, they, Paul and Barnabas and the churches there where they had been ministering, this happens to be up in Antioch, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain others should go up to Jerusalem to what people? To the apostles. So they're intricately involved with all this, see? So that's why I'm saying it's the Jerusalem church that is sending these people out to do this. And the apostles were in control. So you've got to start at the top. So that's where Paul and Barnabas decide to go. They will go to Jerusalem. We'll go to the apostles about this problem and see if they can't stop it. All right. 
So now then let's jump all the way down to verse 5. Paul and Barnabas get to Jerusalem. They meet with the twelve and the leaders of the Jerusalem Jewish church. And there arose certain of the sect of Pharisees. Now, I don't think I have to tell my class people what a Pharisee was. They were the religious elite in Israel. They were the ones, you know, who thought they could commit no sin and they were self-righteous. Okay. But some of those Pharisees became believers that Jesus was indeed the Messiah, so they become members of the Jerusalem church. Okay, so now there rose up in this meeting in Jerusalem Pharisees who believed. And these Pharisees said that it was needful to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. Now, does that need explanation? I wouldn't think so. These Pharisaical Jewish believers in the church of Jerusalem were just bent on the idea that those Gentiles couldn't be saved unless they practiced circumcision and the Mosaic law. All right, now read on. So it was needful in verse 5 to circumcise them and to command them. Now that's not a suggestion, that's a command to keep the law of Moses. Okay, so now then, down to verse 7. And when there had been much disputing, the pros and cons of all this, do Paul's Gentile converts have to become like a Judaizing Jew and be circumcised and keep the law of Moses? And there was a back and forth disputation. I imagine most of the day before they finally come to the conclusion. All right, and now then, verse 12. I'm going to bring you all the way down. Then all the multitude, that is, of these church people at Jerusalem, all confronting Paul and Barnabas, then all the multitude kept silence and gave audience to Barnabas and Paul, declaring what miracles and wonders God had wrought among the Gentiles. See? This was their whole purpose. Their ministry is to Gentile. These Jews are not yet ready to accept that. Okay. Now verse 13, after they had held their peace, in other words, the arguments settled down, and they finally have come to the conclusion that yes, Paul has been sent to the Gentile world with a message wholly and completely different than anything that they had heard in Judaism, and that was the gospel of the grace of God, okay? Now then, after they had held their peace, James, who was the moderator of this building, now remember, of this meeting, now remember this is not the original James, this is the half-brother of Jesus, because the original James was already beheaded some time before. All right, so now this James answered, saying, Men and brethren, now he's addressing his fellow Jews, hearken unto me, Simeon, or Peter, has declared how God at the first did visit the Gentiles, which of course goes to chapter 10, the house of Cornelius. He went to visit the Gentiles to take out of them, that is the Gentile world, a people for his name. Now what's this going to be? The body of Christ, not the kingdom, the body of Christ. It's a whole new ball game now. It's a whole different entity that we're building. But now look at the next verse. Verse 15, And to this agree the words of the prophets, as it is written, and we're quoting from the little minor prophet Amos, we're going to go back and look at it here in a minute, and Amos writes, verse 16, After this, well that's where I always have to stop in him, after what? After the calling out of a Gentile people, after the body of Christ. And when it's complete, now read on. Oh, I'm running out of time. After this the prophet wrote, speaking on behalf of God, of course, I will return. That's speaking of Christ's second coming. And build again the tabernacle of whom? David. So God is going to keep his word with Israel after all. But we don't know how long a parenthetical period of time is in here. But it's so obvious. 
It's a parenthetical period of time that God is going to build the body of Christ and after it's finished, then he will raise up Israel again to come back into the, begin, or into the fullness of all their prophetic program. All right, and God says, and I will set it up. All right, now I've got a couple minutes left, so that should be long enough. Let's go back to the Old Testament again, to the little book of Amos. And if you need help finding it, that's Daniel, Hosea, and Joel, and then Amos. And I want to come into chapter 9, I think it is. Yeah, Amos, chapter 9. And it's a good thing we just talked about the qualifications of the kingdom because here it is again in this series of verses, and we'll just hit it to confirm what we read earlier. Amos, chapter 9, verse 11. This is what James is quoting after that consul in Jerusalem had agreed that Paul and Barnabas could go to the Gentiles and the rest of them would stay with Israel. All right, here's what he quoted. Verse 11, in that day, that is when Christ returns and sets up the kingdom, in that day I will raise up the tabernacle of David that is fallen, it has been now for 1900 and some years, I'll close up the breaches thereof, I'll raise up its ruins, and I will build it as in the days of old. In other words, Israel is going to come back to her future glory. And they will possess the remnant of Edom and all of the heathen which are called by my name, saith the Lord that doeth this. And now verse 13, the same language that we talked about in the last program. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that the plowman shall overtake the reaper, the treader of grapes, him that soweth seed, and the mountain shall drop sweet wine, and all the hills shall melt. Well, what is that? That's all language concerning the kingdom. And when will the kingdom come in? When the body of Christ is complete, and Christ returns and sets up his kingdom once again. And so this is the whole part of Scripture. Now I had one more, and I don't think I've got time to cover it. We'll pick it up in the very first part of our next program. But there is still one more graphic example that God is going to open up the timeline, as I call it, and He's going to let Israel go down into the dispersion, or as Amos said, the tabernacle will fall down. And God is going to call out a people for His name, the body of Christ. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the Scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Feldick Ministries. 30706 West Lona Valley Road, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552, or call 1-800-369-7856. Remember, all programs are available in printed form, audio cassette, and videotape. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Felding.